Good evening to you all. It is my delight and joy as well to welcome you here uh, this evening alongside Gareth, but even more exciting to uh, welcome Christy uh, Wimber to the uh, evening um, celebration. Uh, Christy is a great friend of ours, both uh, for us as a couple and for us as a family, but for us as a wider church family as well. We've known her for a number of years now. And, uh, but perhaps for those of you that, that, that are unfamiliar with Trinity or new to Trinity, it's probably worth knowing something of our DNA, which is rooted in the heart of a movement uh, called the Vineyard Movement. Theologically, I was hugely influenced by this movement where uh, John Wimber, who was uh, Christie's father-in-law, uh, came with a message reminding us of, of the central message of Jesus, which is a, a message which is proclaimed and demonstrated. And that profoundly impacted me. It's impacted the senior team that we have here. It's impacted this church over the years and people that we've sent from here to other places as well uh, uh, around the country and across the world. And uh, it is just such a delight and a joy to have Christy here. She was speaking at a worship conference yesterday. She's here tomorrow as well, staying on one extra day, especially for the women of this church, 7.30 in here. And uh, just a time with Christy, worship, teaching, and ministry as well, which will be a great evening. Uh, I'm just wondering whether I can wear a kilt or not and get in. But uh, probably no. Okay. I do my legs. No? All right. Okay. But can we welcome Christy? And uh, we're going to pray for her. There we are. So lovely to have you here. Keep going. <laughs> had a long weekend so far, haven't you? But you're going shopping tomorrow, I know. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Christy. Thank you for friendship. Thank you for partnership in the gospel. Thank you that, uh, that there is so much that connects us, but most of all, uh, a love for you and a love for your kingdom and a love for your work. And we just pray and ask that you would inspire us, that you'd encourage us, that you'd excite us about you and all that you call us to be and to do now as you anoint Christy in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How are you guys doing? Can't tell if I'm in the center here because all the chairs are all over the place. <laughs> all right. Well, the Lord's here. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Off to a good start. We have had a good time this weekend uh, with the worship. I felt like, um, how many of you guys were here yesterday? Was it yesterday? Oh, two of you. Okay, so let me just fill you in. <laughs> and we, had a, we did have a good day uh, just talking about worship and the power of worship and lots of worship leaders from around the country and um, it was really beautiful last night. One of the best things I think that um, happened was just um, towards the end of the, the event together. And, um, and the Lord just always, as he does, um, you know, so many things and so many different people. But just at the end and everybody worshiping together and singing in the spirit together, there's really nothing like that. So it was a beautiful time. And it is good to be here tonight. So this looks like a different group in different ways, right? Yeah. Good. Um, and um, it's good. The Lord's going to do some good things tonight. So he already has, but there's some more, which is nice. Um, and just praying about um, how to encourage you guys tonight. Um, I do feel like the Lord wants to do um, quite a bit of ministry. Um, and so uh, I'm going to encourage you tonight in something I feel like I'm supposed to encourage you in. Um, but I want to um, take um, time to... Um, uh, to minister to each other. Is that all right? Yeah. Is that why you're here? Are you here to encounter God? I hope so. I sure hope so. Um, I am, how many of you guys, this is your first time to this church? Okay, good. Nice to have you. Um, I pastor a church in California, in Southern California. And, um, and one of my favorite things about what God is doing right now is um, there. Uh, you know, the church goes through seasons and when God's moving and, and how God's moving. And one of the great things that, um, that I'm seeing at home right now is where, um, you know, people are coming to the Lord, but also when people come into the Lord, they're becoming whole. And, um, and how many know it's good to get your body healed, but your mind to be healed um, is a whole nother level and very important. And um, I believe sanity is an important thing to the Lord. And um, he gives us a sound mind. And, um, but it's really great, um, you know, some of the things that we're seeing as in physical healing, but also um, where the Lord's really bringing wholeness. And I think we are coming to a time, it's almost like we're a few years ago, um, we were seeing some of this, but it feels like, um, or it seems 
um, that uh, we're again coming into a time when the Lord's really bringing restoration to people uh, in really wonderful ways. So um, I just feel really privileged to do what I do and um, just to see God's kingdom come week in and week out. And it, it has not been without challenges. Um, and it has not been without um, hardship in all kinds of different ways. And, um, you know, I was just um, sharing with somebody earlier about, uh, you know, some of the things that, that God's doing that are absolutely amazing. But at the same time, in the midst of that, um, where there's, you know, always this sort of opposition or, uh, you know, where the enemy, you know, if you read through the scriptures, the truth is there is no great miracle without the enemy right there on the tail, you know, the enemy's right there, you know, trying to discourage, trying to distract, trying to um, get us separated from whatever it is that God's doing in our life. So it has not been without much opposition and seeing God do wonderful things. But at the same time, there has been this perseverance. I don't know why I'm going in this, but I'm just going to go here for a second. There is a perseverance that oftentimes God will call us into where we have to push through things that we wish we didn't have to push through. And this is definitely this whole last year, probably about the last you know, I don't know, 13, 14 months has been a season like that for me where I've had to make the choice over and over again to really persevere. Now, in the midst of that, I see amazing things and I see amazing miracles and the Lord's doing a wonderful work. But the, the truth is, if I were to be honest about it, it's also been one of the hardest seasons because I've had to get up daily and make the choice to persevere through some really difficult things. And, um, and I just felt like to encourage you in that today because a lot of the times we just want to encounter, and who doesn't, just the good stuff and uh, the easy stuff. But oftentimes the work that God does in us only happens to us when we have to persevere through the hard stuff. Um, so that was for free. I'm actually not even talking about that tonight. Um, I'm going to talk actually out of Matthew chapter 4. So if you want to go ahead and turn there. I'm going to... I feel, um, well, I'll get to it. Matthew chapter 4. This is the calling of the first disciples. Um, I want us to see a picture tonight. Just um, This really is a picture of discipleship, but it also is a picture of us as disciples. When we say yes to Christ, what that looks like. And, uh, and when we say yes to him, uh, some things that should be, you know, kind of coming out of our life. The fruit of, of us saying yes to him um, and the importance of that. And... Um, uh, through the scripture, we find where, you know, Christ says that he created us in him, in his image, but in that, that he also prepares us in advance to do good work. So we're invited into the kingdom, but in the kingdom, we're also uh, invited into the works of the kingdom and the advancing of the kingdom. So he didn't just save us uh, to save us. He saved us to invite us into uh, participate, to co-labor with him, so to speak. And that's why he, uh, you know, all through the Gospels where Jesus' message was, the time is here, the kingdom is near, the kingdom is at hand, repent, this is it, it's right in front of you. Sometimes, you know, calling us to become like little children so that we can see whatever it is that he's doing. But we need to know that as disciples, when we say yes to Jesus, that we're saying yes to an invitation. And in that invitation, there's things that God has invited us into. So chapter 4 here, starting in verse 18, says this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, and they were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. So this is really kind of a classic picture of how Jesus calls us. I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord. I don't know um, if you have never said yes to Jesus yet. I don't know if you've been on a journey for many years, uh, but I do think that it's important that we are reminded of how God calls us, and then again, that invitation. So we find first here where Jesus saw, and I think this is really powerful when we, when we talk about how Jesus sees us because it's different than how, um, you know, we see each other. And oftentimes it's much different than even how we see ourselves. But both times here it says that Jesus saw Peter and Andrew and Jesus saw James and John. And the word saw here, it actually means so much because when we talk about when I see somebody, you know, when I'm looking at James, I'm looking at James, I'm seeing the outward appearance of who James is. But I'm not necessarily seeing what's beyond what's in front of me. 
The word see here, when Jesus saw Peter and Andrew, and when he saw James and John, he didn't just see them with his eyes. It also translated means that he saw them with his senses. In other words, in his discernment and being ever perceiving and all knowing that he would be able to see James and know everything about James, sense everything about James, know James from the inside out. Yet the amazing thing is, is that he still calls them. And so, so if we look at our life, even, even personally, one of the things that I hear quite often, actually as a pastor, is most people around us feel overlooked. Most people feel that God chooses other people besides himself, or m- most people feel in some way or another that what God has is, you know, maybe for, you know, the people around them, but not necessarily the invitation being to them. And there's this longing that, that many people have where they feel like they're almost look past. And I find it interesting that when we see that how Jesus invites us into his kingdom, that he's not just seen, he's not just seen us from the outside, but he's also seen us from the inside. He's knowing our past, he's knowing our present, and he's knowing our future. He knows everything about us. He's not looking past us. He's looking directly into us, knowing all of that. And in that, all of our weaknesses, all the places that we fail, all the places that we fall short. And the amazing thing is, is he says, I pick you. I see you. I know you. Yet I still want you. That's how God is. That's how he how he operates. Second Chronicles 69. This is a picture of how God you know, sees the universe, sees all of us, you know, roaming around for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those hearts who are fully committed to him. I love another trans, uh, another version that says this, for the eyes of Adonai move here and there throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are wholeheartedly toward him. Adonai, which is the, the, the plural form of master or Lord, that our Lord, that our master, that his eyes are roaming throughout the earth and he's looking for people to strengthen. He's looking for people to call. He's looking for people to empower. That's who our God is. And so what we need to know is that we, we all have this invitation. The thing about the gospel message is the gospel message is all-inclusive. It's not just for a few. It's not for those that are the gifted. It's not for the ones that have it all together. The gospel message is not just for us, but it's also for all of those around us. It's also for the people that we tend to look past. It's also for the people that we tend to discount. It's also for the people that we tend to write off. And God himself says, no, wait a second. I see beyond what you see. So the call is not just for us. It's all inclusive for also the people around us. He sees you, yet he calls you. He knows you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the things that you're great at. But this is the amazing thing about God is he doesn't just see us where we're at. He sees us where we can be. And what God does is he has this wonderful thing about him. That when he sees what we can be, those are the things that he begins to call forth. See, oftentimes we'll only look at ourselves and we'll only see where we're at or where we're failing or where our weaknesses is and are and we'll discount ourselves. And what God does is God says, no, what I see in you is much greater than what you even see in yourself. See, God actually trusts you more than you realize. And he'll trust you even more than you trust yourself. That's who God is. Because he sees the potential in us. And he sees what we can be. And those are the things that he often calls forth, just like he called it forth in the disciples. So Jesus sees us. Second thing we find is that Jesus called. He said this. He said, follow me and I will make you into disciples. The word follow here means come now. There's a force with it. In other words, when Jesus is calling the disciples, he's not, you know, he's not this sort of, you know, when you have time. There's a demand behind it. And the demand is it when at his voice when he says, "Listen, I want you to come. I want you to follow me because I'm going to make you into something." That that it was it was a, an invitation, but it was an invitation to be answered right away. And their response, you know, kind of gives picture to that because they, it says actually immediately, another version says straight away. In other words, in the, in, the, in the doing of life, in their everyday life, and how they earned money, of how they, you know, were uh, around the people that were, they were usually around, so to speak. In the midst of that, here we find Jesus comes and he intervenes in their life. He intersects them. Have you ever been intersected by God? 
where all of a sudden you're going one way and all God just comes and he intersects you and he gets your attention. This is how the Lord operates with me, by the way, because sometimes I can just go and go and go. And many times what God will do with me is he'll intersect me. That's how, that's the only way that I can actually kind of describe it because what I feel like he does is he kind of just comes in and he kind of just gets my attention, whatever he wants to get my attention in. And then he completely wholeheartedly puts my heart in that direction. That's an intersection. That's what happened with the disciples here from the voice of Jesus. And this is how powerful his voice is. That when he says, follow me straight away, that they left, which means translated, it means to let go. It means to leave behind. It means to abandon. You know what else it means? It means to forgive. It also means to suffer. When they left, what they were making a, a choice to do, they weren't just leaving, you know, um, their, their uh, you know, things that they had known for a long time. They were leaving their security they were leaving their family. They were leaving their friends. And they were also having to live in the right spirit. How many know you can actually live from the wrong spirit? There's more than one spirit out there. This is important. You can actually make choices and you can actually live from the wrong spirit. There's more than one spirit out there. And when God invites us into something, we're supposed to react and respond from the right spirit. It's our spirit, man, that identifies with his spirit that we actually belong to him. That's what Romans talks about. Romans 5 and Romans 8, that when God responds to us and we respond back to him, that's our spirit, man. And when God's voice comes, it's our spirit man that's in response to him. That's the right spirit. How do I know if I'm really hearing from the Lord? It's going to lead me into freedom. That's how I know it's the Lord. Is when I'm responding to the Lord and it brings me into this freedom. So in other words, God can speak something to me like, I want you to stop. I want you to leave everything and I want you to follow me. But if I know it's the voice of the Lord, then I can leave everything. And I'm willing to suffer for it. And I'm willing to say yes. Why? Because it's my spirit man that's saying yes. It's not my comfort zone. It's the spirit in me that identifies that I actually belong to him. That's the place that I belong. That's the place that I live. That's the place that I said yes to. And learning to live from that place is actually living in the place of freedom. And truly, when we hear the voice of the Lord, that's what changes everything. I mean, I think it's great. Don't you think it's great when people minister to you and they pray for you and they get some words for you? And it's very encouraging, right? It's a good thing. But, and I, I think it's important. It's an important aspect of our walk with the Lord. But there's a whole nother level that I think is really important. And that is that you and I learn to hear the voice of God ourselves. You have to know the, the voice of God yourself. You have to know how God speaks to you. You have to know how God leads you. And this is partly because many times people will believe that God calls them. But they sometimes feel like God's calling me alongside other people. And then I'm not worthy enough, or I'm not good enough, or I don't know how to hear God's voice, or I don't, need to, I don't know how to recognize what the Lord, you know, what's the Lord and what's not. And they sometimes discount the call because of that, or they come alongside other people. When those other people fall away, then they begin to fall away. So you and I have to learn to hear God's voice for ourselves. And the invitation is, I want you to come. I want you to leave everything. I want you to, you know, sign up, so to speak. I want you to be willing to sacrifice. Remember when Jesus said, listen, if you say yes to me, this is actually going to cost you something. Did you read that part of the Bible? <laughs> when Jesus said, if you say yes to me, this might cost you some of your friends. This might cost you some of your relationships. And not only that, some people might hate you. That's the gospel message. When we say yes to that, we're saying yes to the cost. We're saying yes to die again. We're saying yes to lay everything down and to say yes to whatever it is that he has for us. So there's nothing about, I mean, there's something about really hearing his voice. Because the call of discipleship, the gospel message, is the call to come and die. And this is, I think, what we're missing in our culture. We're missing, actually, in the church culture. We're missing this call to come and die. And that this is going to cost us something. And this is going to be painful at times. And we're going to end up going through things that we wish we didn't have to go through. You know, we often forget that all of the disciples but one were martyred. They were all killed for the sake of the gospel. They all bought in. Why did they buy in? Because they heard the voice of Jesus. To hear the voice of Jesus gives you a perspective that you will be willing to suffer for. When we hear his voice, it also gives us a perspective and it reminds us of the things that are really important. But this is the truth when it talks about discipleship. You have to learn to deal with death. If you don't live with death, I mean, if you don't kind of deal with death, you'll never really truly live. How many know that no matter what you eat, no matter what you drink, you're still going to die? 
your terminal. That's encouraging. Your terminal. But you know, the truth is, lots of people have never learned to live because they've never dealt with death. And many times we still live in that place where we haven't ourselves been dead to things. And when we live in that place, it's always this struggle and we never fully live. The cost of discipleship, do you realize the surrender to discipleship is actually your ticket to freedom? It's your ticket to life. It's your ticket to the, to the invitation that God invites us into. So the real question is, now what are we and who are we going to live our life for? He calls us. He gives us the invitation. He invites us in. Now who are we going to live our life for? The interesting thing here is the word that's used here in, um, in, uh, in Matthew, we find also in Matthew uh, chapter 11 where it says, Come unto me all who are in labor and are, are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In other words, those of you that are weary, those of you that are under a bondage, those of you that are under a burden, so to speak, if you come to me, Jesus says, I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you rest for a soul. In fact, rest is actually part of our inheritance. It talks about it in Matthew, but it also talks about it in First Peter, that our inheritance, rest is part of our inheritance. And so we find the same Lord who says, and earlier in Matthew where he says, I want you to come and I want you to leave everything. I want you to come and I want you to die is the same Lord that we find later that says, I'm going to walk you through this as well. I'm going to carry the burden. I'm going to carry the load. That's who God is. That he doesn't just invite us in to survive. He doesn't just invite us in and say, hey, I hope you make it. He invites us in to the call of discipleship because that's where our true life is. But in that, he never leaves us alone. He always walks through life with us. Right? Amen? It's one of the most powerful things that we have in Manuel, that God is with us. So the only way that we miss out on this is if we say no. Is that when we hear his voice and we, you know, kind of whatever, turn it off or become hardened to it. And, and oftentimes, you know, I'll encounter people where they'll, you know, f feel in, in different ways where they feel like they're missing out on the kingdom. Or they feel like they're missing parts of who God is. Or they feel like, you know, that God has more for them. But for some reason, they're not seeing it. And it always, for me, just goes back to that question. Have you surrendered everything you are to Christ? Because the truth is, when we surrender everything to him, that is the place that he invites us in and that we get to see more. We get to see some of the most amazing things. I've had it where people have said to me in my life, this is crazy. People have said to me in my life, you just have it easy. You just have it easy because for whatever reason in their mind, they think my life is easy. They don't live it. But for some reason, there's that, you know, the grass is always greener, which is never true, by the way. That's an illusion. There, the grass is never greener. There's just more grass. That's really what it is. And the grass is greener where you water it. That's the truth. But there is this illusion that we think that somebody else's life is better or easier than ours. So I've had people say to me through the years, you know, your life is just easier. And, um, and one of the things that I've realized is, no, my life is not easy. It's just that what I decided all those years ago is that my life is not my own. My life belongs to the Lord. And I've learned that in following his voice, that there's a blessing and that there's a peace that comes upon my life. And that's the thing that you're wanting. And if you want to have that life of peace and if you want to have that life of blessing, then all you have to do is say yes to the Lord. Because it is for all of us. It's all inclusive. And so much of the time we think that there's this easy road. There is no easy road. There are no shortcuts to the kingdom, by the way. And shortcuts are always short-lived. There is no shortcuts in the kingdom. The only road that we have is the road of obedience. The road of saying yes. And every time we say yes in obedience, that's where the blessing is. And, and the picture of discipleship is so much of the time we miss out on things because we're still holding a part of the world. We're still not dead to something. We're still holding on to the past. We're still holding on to an idea. We're still holding on to an addiction. We're still holding on to something that we were caught in before. And oftentimes we, we can't take what is and we can't grab what's coming if we're, if we're too you know, full of the, of the past, if we're holding on to what was. Holding on to what was will always kill what is. And many times what God will do, and this he'll do this in discipleship, he'll come to you and he says, listen, I have something for you, but before I can give that to you, you need to be willing to change this in your life. In other words, what was okay over here will kill you over here. So I want you to let go of that here. I want you to surrender that part 
of you to me here because you won't be able to carry that where I'm taking you. It's mercy of the Lord. But it's also, if you want more of the Lord, you have to be willing to take less of yourself. It's also, you know, when, when the Lord says, hey, listen, I want to change that in you. It's always his mercy because it means that he has more for us. And much of the time we want to hold on to the old. We want to hold on to something just to feel like some sort of security, which is a false illusion, by the way. We live in a world that we like these false sort of illusions, ideas of, of security that we think are secure. When in reality, is, it's not true. It's not, it's not true for anybody. A few years ago... I live in California where we get earthquakes, and, um, and they're not fun. They're just not fun. But you do get used to them in a way, and um, not used to them like we, you know, enjoy them and get popcorn and all that, but, but you just get used to them, and you, you, you kind of just, that's how you live. Well, I realized probably about, I don't know if it was three years ago or so when I was in New Zealand, and they had that national disaster, you know, the massive earthquake. And my son and I were there, and it was horrible. And what I realized, the first thing I realized was I have never really been in an earthquake. That was the first thing. And the second thing I realized is, boy, we sure live in a world of false security. We sure feel like we have all this time left. We sure feel like, oh, I'll say yes to God about that then, or I'll give up that part of my life when I feel like it over here, or I just want a little bit more time, or, you know, just this false sense of security that we hold more than what we actually hold. So every time that God comes to us about something or an invitation that he wants to invite us into something, usually it's because he has a blessing for us, but it's also because oftentimes we're holding on to something that's actually killing us. And so one of my favorite theologians is uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he's just, you know, this great theologian that was killed in the concentration camps, and he said this about discipleship. He said, we can only achieve perfect liberty and enjoy fellowship with Jesus uh, when his command, his call to absolute discipleship is appreciated in its entirety. Only the man who follows the command of Jesus single-mindedly and unrestedly holds, uh, lets his yoke rest upon him, finds his burden easy, and under its gentle pressure re receives the power to persevere in the right way. The command of Jesus is hard, utterly hard for those who try and resist resist it. But for those who willingly submit, the yoke is easy and the burden is light. That's the way of discipleship. That when we say yes, it's actually to our freedom. Or we can listen to the great theologian Homer Simpson who says, if something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing. I mean, seriously, that's our culture. That is our culture. If it's too hard, don't do it. If it takes too much of your energy, if it takes too much of your time, if it takes too much discipline, why even bother? Or if I'm not going to get this, then if I have to work for it, you mean I have to work for it? But what we've done is we've devalued what's valuable. And discipleship in the call of invitation to the kingdom is valuable. And sometimes we forget that privilege because we're so caught up in maybe the price tag or having to let go of things seems too high. And we have devalued something that's quite precious to the Lord. So this invitation that Jesus sees us, but then he calls us, but in that we have to have choice. We do have choice. And the freedom that we have in saying yes to him, that's, that only comes by surrender. That only comes by saying, Lord, you can have every part of who I am. I don't know who had that word tonight, but I thought that was interesting because I was talking about that tonight, is being able to give God every part of who you are. And surrendering in that, because that's where your freedom lies. Jesus saw, Jesus calls, and the third thing is that Jesus makes. And Jesus says, I want you to follow me because I'm going to make you into something. I'm going to make you into, into fishers of men. And the word make there actually means formed. It means to construct, but it also means to perform to a promise. This is where the promise of your life, this is your destiny, so to speak. When Jesus sees you and he calls you, he wants to make you. He wants to mold you. He wants to construct you. And he wants to, to bring the, the promises and the purposes of your life into fruition. That's what discipleship is, that he always has so much more for us than we can ever imagine. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, hey, listen, I want you to follow me. I see you. I want you to follow me because I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make you famous. 
I'm going to give you an ability. You're going to have all the money you want. You're going to have all the way. He doesn't do it. I mean, your life's going to be easy. There's no promises of that. In fact, in this life, do you realize that all through the scriptures, there's not one promise that our life is going to be easy. Our only promise in, our life, in this life is Jesus. That's the greatest promise that we have. It's not about it being easy. I, I remember we have this whole thing in the States. Have you ever heard, you know, about the American dream? You know? And this this whole thing, we go in and out of seasons where the American dream is like, you know, the big, you know, what everybody wants. Everybody dreams of the house, the two cars, the 2.5 kids, all of that kind of stuff. And we call it the American dream. And I often think that sometimes we think of the kingdom as the American dream. And we try to fit that mindset that this is what I want, this is what I plan. And I'll tell you, you guys are no really different here. And I want that to fit into my mindset about the kingdom. And it's not about having everything in order. It's not about answering the call and getting everything that we want or we think we want, so to speak. When Jesus says that he's going to make it, make us, what he's going to do is he's actually going to conform us. But he's not going to conform us. He's not going to construct us. He's not going to make us into our image. He's going to make us into who we're called to be in him. He's going to cause us to love the things he loves. He's going to give us the desires that actually change us from the inside out. There's something about when God calls us, and this is, again, why I think it's so important that we need to hear the voice of the Lord. Because when God's voice comes, that's what changes everything. When God says, I'm going to make you something, I have this for you. This is your destiny. This is what you have. This is what I believe, that so many people's destiny, so many people's dreams have been pushed down so far because they were wired for something little. And for whatever reason or whatever they heard, we just discount those things in children we discount those things and they begin to dream about being an astronaut or being a, a lawyer being a, a queen or a princess or whatever it is and we discount those things and we talk them down and we do that with people's destinies and we do that with people's dreams and then all of a sudden people begin to settle and then the voice that they hear begins to get quieter and quieter and we begin to kind of, you know, put God in a box of what God can do in our life. And we kind of just settle for, okay, well, I'll just go ahead and take this. When that's not the way, there's nothing in the gospel message about settling. There's nothing about the kingdom that's about just settling this. It's always about, I'm going to make you into this because I have so much more. And what God has for us and so much more is a promise. There's the promise of purpose. There's the promise of what he's invited us into. And his desire is that he will make you. His desire is that he will form you into all that you're called to be, all that you're meant to be. You are recognized, by the way. I mean, you are, you're designed. You are wired to hear the voice of God. Those of you that struggle with this, you're actually wired to hear the voice of God. And many of you, you actually hear God's voice. You just don't know that that's what it is. Some of you really get beat up over this because you feel like people around you hear God and you don't. You are wired. You're literally wired to hear your father's voice. And many times we just haven't been taught properly. And so we just don't understand that that's what we're actually hearing is the Lord. I do believe that that's why the culture around us being so busy and I said this yesterday when I was praying before the conference about something. And I felt like the Lord had, had um, said to me, I was speaking about faithfulness. And I felt like the Lord had said, you know, oftentimes we confuse busyness with faithfulness. And we think being busy is that we're being faithful to God. And, you know, we all get busy in things. But oftentimes we get so busy that we confuse that that being faithful and discipleship to the Lord. When in the reality is it's not busyness that actually creates more of God's presence on us. It's actually faithfulness. Faithfulness is what attracts more of God's presence. Busyness actually distracts us and actually disconnects us from more of him. And I think in our culture, even hearing God's voice, one of the things that the enemy loves to do is he loves to take the distractions around us and use those things to make it to where we can't tune into the right thing at the right time at the right moment that we need more than anything else. And that is the voice of the Lord. And I think we're in a time where there's so many distractions, we actually have to be intentional to hear God's voice. Is that not true? We have to be intentional to say, Lord, you know, all of these things that are coming at me, the Lord said to me years ago, at the end of the day, Christy, you, you know, my voice has to be the loudest. And what I've learned is that many times I have to, I have to get away. I have to silence things so I can, I can recognize his voice because the enemy loves to use distraction, right? 
So in the call that God has invited us into, it's important that we hear his voice. But in saying yes, what we're doing is we're saying yes to the process. What we're doing is we're saying, yes, Jesus, you can go ahead and make me. You can go ahead and form me. Years ago, I saw the, the picture of, um, you know, pottery being made. And I didn't realize that they actually take the clay and they throw it on the ground. And they just beat the living heck out of it. And I'm looking at that going, he is... He's the potter and I'm the clay. Look who's getting beat up. But that's, that's, what it's, that's what it is, is that many times it feels like that. But what he's doing is that even in the pain of it, even in the, you know, kind of having to work through stuff and being stretched and all of that stuff, what he's doing is he's making you into your destiny. And he's making you into the disciple that you're called to be. So our choice in it is that we say yes to when he calls we say yes to his voice, but also in that, that we're saying yes to the process. Lord, that even if this hurts, even if you have to stretch me a bit, you know, I'm going to say yes to the process. You know what I found? I found that most people want to be experts. Nobody wants to be a beginner. We always want to know everything. But in the kingdom, it's actually the learners that learn the most about who our God is. It's always the children. It's always the ones that don't know. And sometimes we know too much. And sometimes in knowing too much, it actually keeps us for more of him. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I have to unlearn things. Because even in process, when the Lord's making me into the disciple I'm supposed to be, I can say, you don't need to do it that way. You can do it this way. You can mold me like this, Lord. You can construct me like this. Do you really have to do it like that? And sometimes I've, what I've seen or what I've experienced actually makes it harder for me to receive in what he's wanting to do or stretch in me now because I haven't experienced it before. And many times when God's making us, when he's molding us, when he's constructing us, he's going to stretch us in ways that we've never been stretched before, that we've never encountered before. And it's a scary thing, isn't it? Isn't it a scary thing when, when God begins to do something with you and you, you know, it, it feels like you're kind of standing on a cliff, you're going to jump off and there's no water below, which is the kingdom, by the way. And so I think saying yes to the process is important. We're saying yes to being stretched. We're saying yes, that I will be a beginner. That's why I love that verse in Philippians 1 where it talks about, it's a promise to us actually, where God says, the work that I started in you, I'm going to bring that to completion. In other words, no matter where you're at in the process, God's promise to us is that if we yield to him and we yield to the process, his promise is that he'll bring us complete, that it will be complete. He's not going to leave us hanging, so to speak, right? So if I can encourage you in this, because in discipleship, this is, this is a lifelong choice, Daily discipleship is a daily choice, many times a day sometimes, that we're saying yes to the Lord and we're saying uh, you know, no to the world around us and we're saying yes to the cost and we're saying yes to the process. And that one of the best places that you and I can learn to live is that we don't know everything. We don't see everything and we don't know everything. I read this letter about this young woman. Uh, she wanted to go to college, um, but... Uh, there was a question on the, the questionnaire for the college, and when she read it, her heart sank because uh, one of the questions asked her if she was a leader. And so she was being honest, and, um, and she wrote no, and she returned the application and expecting the worst because she really wanted to get into this college. And to her surprise, she received this letter back from the college, and it said this. It said, Dear Applicant, a study of the application form reveals that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it's imperative that you uh, come so we have at least one follower. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. We always want to say that we know more or we want to say we're farther along than what we are. But the truth is just being moldable, God can use you in powerful ways. Just being able to say, I don't know everything, God can use us and form us to whoever or however he chooses to do so. So how do we know that we're on the right path? Well, he says, listen, I'm going to call you. I see you. I'm going to call you, but then I'm going to make you. And what is he going to make us into? He's going to make us into fishers of men. In other words, if we're not a fisher of men, then I would question what we're following. Let me say that again. If we're not fishers of men... If we're not doing the kingdom that God has invited us into, then I would question, 
Who are we following then? Because if we're being made by him, that means that we're being conformed to be a better fisherman. Which means we should have fish around us. Which means for all of us, it will look different, isn't it? Because the truth is, we're all called to different fish. So if I would say, okay, I am called to be a fisher of men. That's what God has molded me into. That's what God's called me into. That's what discipleship is. Then what I need to know is what kind of fish am I called to? Because the truth is in the church, there's this huge variety of fish. But in the church, we kind of limit it. And the truth is some of us are called to, you know, mackerel. Some of us are called to tuna. Some of us are called to lobster. And some of us are called to shrimp. I'm called to lobster. But so much of the time... We don't know the fish that we're called to. And so much of the, the time, the church doesn't smell like fish. And you know the healthiest picture of the church is when we smell like fish? That's a healthy church. Why? Because it's a discipled church. A discipled church is when we have all of those, you know, the smells and the bells around us, so to speak, because that means that we're doing whatever it is that we're called to do. And when God makes us, into becoming more like him. You know, one of the things that begins to change in us, all of a sudden, we begin to have a heart for the people around us. All of a sudden, we begin to love people that we didn't love before. All, the, all of a sudden, we begin to want some of the things that God wants for them that we are in ourselves would never have picked. All of a sudden, we are, we're willing to sacrifice. We're willing to invite people. We're willing to tell people about Jesus. That's what happens when you hang out with Jesus? When you hang out with Jesus, you begin to love the things that Jesus loves. And the truth is, when God's working on us, what's one of the things that God does in us? We begin to have a heart for the things that he has a heart for. And what God has a heart for more than anything else is the people around us. That's it. The greatest commandment. I want you to love me with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And I want you to love the people that I place around you. That's it. That's what we're going to stand before. I mean, one of the greatest calls that we have as a disciple is not signs and wonders. It's to love each other. Because when we love each other, that's what will get the attention of the world. But also when we love each other, that's what will attract the people around us. Love is so attractive, is it not? Love is so attractive. So this is my encouragement to you tonight. God sees you. He knows you. He knows your stuff. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the things that you're caught in right now. He knows your despair. He also knows your dreams. And he also knows your destiny. And he sees you and he wants you. And not only does he, he want you, he calls you. And in the call, he wants to form you into his image. It's the greatest invitation of what we have to become like the master. And this is what I believe in the Gospels that it says, as long as we're learning, as long as we're becoming more like the one who's teaching us, which is the master. So if we're becoming more and more like Jesus, that means our life should be encountering some of the same things that Jesus himself encountered. And if we read through the Gospels of what Jesus encountered, it wasn't easy because he was rejected. He was ridiculed. He was beaten. Yet he still gave himself to the people around him. And when we become more like Jesus, all of a sudden, not only, not only do we catch his heart for the people around us, but we also encounter some of the same hardships that Jesus himself encountered. That's why he said, count it all joy, that you get to identify my sufferings as well as, you know, uh, as well as all the other stuff. It's, it's a privilege that we get to identify with Christ in the sufferings as well as the great triumphs that we have. But he also promises to give us his spirit through all of it. Amen? Amen. God's making you into someone. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter where you come from. He wants to make you into the promise of what you always have been destined to be. That's what he has for us. And your choice is to say yes to the process. And your choice is to surrender every part of who you are Till he makes that part of you to look more like him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? Let's do 